Well, good morning to all you guys who stayed in town. Still think we've got some guys traveling. Decided to go out of, out of town for the week of Mardi Gras. But thank you guys for, for being here. Uh, let's see, I think I'm going to put most of these passages up on the screen behind me. But if you like to look at things in your Bible, the first place I'm going to ask you to find is going to be in Malachi chapter 1. So if you need a little advance notice on where to find Malachi, last book of the Old Testament, that's where we'll be first, Malachi chapter 1. Uh, this will be... I'm going to say this is going to be our last week in this series called Vocabulary Words for Our Times, but there is one particular vocabulary word that I have not been able to get to in this time frame, so if I just resurrect this later in the year, you'll, you'll have to just give me permission to do that, but I just wanted us to, to move on to some other things. I feel like the Lord wants us to do that as well, but the reason why we started this year off this way was to make us aware of some words that are vitally important to the life that you and I are called to live this year. And they're not just words randomly grabbed. These words represent words that have been displaced or distorted by our culture. So you live in a culture today that is going to work and the way in which it's communicating, the way in which it's interacting with our lives, it is distorting these words, or it's just displacing them. It's just making them words that we don't spend any time with, words that we ignore. But for God, these are vital words. These are critically important words. And, and that list, the list could have been long. I just really did just a, a sampling of some words that are very, very important to us. But I could not conclude a, a series on words without concluding with the word that we're going to look at today. And that, that word is love. And it is a drastically distorted and in many ways displaced word that we need to get some understanding on. So let, let me start by joining a group of people. Here's God's people. These are God's people who are going to be interacting with God. In the book of Malachi, if you're not familiar with where that is, it's, it's the, the last thing that's going to be said in the Old Testament. And it's going to await the book of Matthew before the scriptures are going to speak to us again. So this is the last book and the last communication. The year is maybe 450 BC. So it's going to be 400 plus years before further revelation is going to be spoken and given in the form of the word. But listen carefully to what God is going to say. Here's the very opening of this prophetic book. It says, The oracle of the word of the Lord to Israel by Malachi. I have loved you, says the Lord. But you say, how have you loved us? This is God's answer. Is not Esau Jacob's brother, declares the Lord, yet... I have loved Jacob, but Esau I have hated. I have laid waste his hill country and left his heritage to jackals of the desert. If Edom says, we are shattered, but we will rebuild the ruins, the Lord of hosts says, they may build, but I will tear down. They will be called the wicked country and the people with whom the Lord is angry forever. This is an interesting response. It's an interesting statement God is going to make to them. And it's a little bit challenging to unpack. But isn't it interesting? I'm not going to unpack this fully. So you should walk away from this message with a bunch of questions. And like any of these words we picked on, we're grabbing these enormous words and doing one message on the very difficult to do. This was a very frustrating thing to study this week because of the criticalness of this word. But God is going to go from answering the issue of love to explaining how he chose Jacob but not Esau. And I know that, that, that topic in and of itself should get your attention. Why wouldn't God just choose everybody? Okay, well, I'm not going to answer that almost at all today. I'm just going to make you aware that that's exactly what he did because that's how God explains himself. And God explains that against the backdrop of a bunch of people who don't feel loved by him. They raise the question, hey, you've loved us. 
Really? Where's the love? And God contrasts the way in which he has related to them with the way in which he has related to Esau and his descendants who did not receive from God what this other group of people have been receiving year upon year upon year. But here's what's critical. I just want you to catch this. This is the people of God at some point stand before God and say, we just ain't feeling the love, God. I just ain't feeling the love, man. So if that's how you feel, you're not alone. John Piper says, when God said in verse 2, I have loved you, says the Lord, the Israelites responded skeptically. How hast thou loved us? Now, test yourselves here. How would you answer that question in your own life? How would you describe God's love to you? Is your life and family in such a shambles that you feel as skeptical about it as the Israelites did? Do you want to say, how hast thou loved me? I don't doubt that there is a little of that in all of us. And so it will do us all good to listen to God's answer, which is almost never heard today. We all know this. This is the reality. At some point, you're going to live your life into a space and a time and a set of events and conflicts of relationship or something that's missing that's going to make you ask the question, does God love me? I, I just don't know right now. I just don't know that I feel like God loves me. And that's the, where these guys were. And what's interesting about living as the people of God in 450 BC is that the storyline leading up to this, you know, God rescued them long ago from Egypt, brings them into the promised land, blesses them with all kinds of abundance in this land of milk and honey. But they struggle with idolatry while living in that land for years and years and years, back and forth, back and forth, with God, against God, with God, for God, against God. And then God disciplines them and sends them off into exile. And they are no longer in the land of promise. They're living in the land of exile. They spend 70 years. 70 years begins the return. And then some take longer than that to return. But they're back in the land now in 450. Right? So the exile is over. They're back in the land. They're rebuilding. There's construction work going on. Got cranes all over the place. You know, economy's starting to happen. And it's in that moment when they're not feeling the love. I could guess at a bunch of things, but you know, a couple of things that just leap out at me about the nature of humanity. This is this is our problem too. In some ways, they they got what they longed for. They're back in the land. They're rebuilding. There's stuff going on. Do you ever notice sometimes the worst thing that can happen to you is that you finally get what you long for? There is a moment of misery that comes with that. Because for the longest time, like this carrot at the end of a stick, you have chased this thing and chased this thing and wanted this thing and wanted this thing. And, and along the way, you've sold yourself and convinced yourself on the idea, if I just, if I just had that... If there's anything, let me just warn you, if there's anything in your life right now that feels that way, the worst day of your life is coming the day after you catch that thing. Because you will discover something that is so empty, that does not deliver, that falls short, that disappoints you. That's what's waiting for you. In this moment. So is that what's happening with them? Well, I can think that could be what's happening with them. But when you read all of Malachi, uh, this, they don't have a very good resume. These guys have got issues. God has restored them, but, but they've got problems. Here's a, here's a quick running account. John Piper's quote here on the condition that they were in. He says, the people had not learned their lesson from exile. They had grown, listen to this list, skeptical of God's love. That's what we're interacting with here. Careless in worship, indifferent to the truth, chapter 2. 
disobedient to the covenant in chapter 2. Faithless in their marriages in chapter 2 and in chapter 3. God's going to bring that up. And stingy in their offerings, right? This is the famous book from which we get, Will a man rob God? But you are robbing me by not bringing me the full tithe into my storehouse. Right? This is where we get this from. This is their resume. This is the condition of their life. Piper says, to this carnal and rebellious people, God sent his messenger. And the first message he put on his lips was, I have loved you, says the Lord. Beware. Because this is a people whose heart is responding. God, the first thing God brings up is he defends the fact that he has loved them. Can you imagine the God of the universe who has stooped to the level that he stoops to to relate to us? Having to defend that he actually has loved us. To which they respond. Really? How's that? Beware. Be very aware. You see that list right there? Careless in worship, indifferent to the truth, disobedient to the covenant, faithless in your marriage, stingy in your offerings. If those things describe your life, I can almost promise you, you ain't going to be feeling the love either. And isn't it amazing Our lives get in that kind of a condition and then we bring charges against God. Like he's done something wrong. You know, the Bible doesn't put accent on words when you read it, right? So you read the Bible and you introduce accent to it, right? I have loved you, says the Lord. Where do you put the accent? Well, you know, the Bible doesn't really tell you where to put the accent. But I wonder if the accent goes on the word have. I have loved you says the Lord. And then he defends one of the ways in which he absolutely has loved them. Now listen, critical to your life journey, to my life journey, I'm going to venture into 2019 this year. At some point, life is going to serve up something that's going to make me feel like the love of God is nowhere to be found or at best it's just very distant and I'm not feeling it right now. And what we're going to learn today becomes critically, critically important to us. Now, if we were to shop for important words in the Bible, I would dare say many people would make this word the top choice of important words that exist in our, in our human existence. But maybe even the Bible as well. Can you think of a word that's more important to you than love that's in the Bible? Maybe technically you'd come up with something. But at the end of the day, this is a massively important word to us, isn't it? You and I are desiring, needing, craving, looking for, giving away. Love is a massively important concept to us. But let me ask you this question. I'm being attacked by my microphone here. I just complained to Pete how this thing doesn't work right. Where is Pete? Buys bad equipment. Um, at some point this word is going to be the cornerstone word for something about your life people who come to God with no idea about God at least will conclude he is a God of love never read the Bible don't really know much about him at all, but they've concluded that. Now, let me just, let me just do a quick test here. Nobody, nobody's got to own up to this or not. But if, if you'd be here saying, okay, I don't know, Keith, I I'm, I'm, I'm probably would agree. Maybe that, that's a top word in all the Bible. Or if it's not the top word, it's right there near the top. There's not a whole lot of other words. All right, given that that's what you're going to conclude, I think most of us would conclude that. Let me ask you this question. Have you ever done a systematic study of the Bible and all that it says about that word? Have you ever sat down, cover to cover? This is easy to do today. Years ago, this was not easy to do. Today, it's very easy to do. Just take out your pocket Bible in your phone and feed in the little question mark thing that you feed stuff into and you stick the word love in there and it'll pull up every verse that's got the word love in it. It's a a long list because that word's very used a lot. But if you, 
If you, and let's say, have you ever done a systematic study of the word love? Because it's, it's a concept you and I, we defend, we run to it, we're sure about it, we know certain things, but I'd be amazed if many hands would go up right now and I actually asked you, have you ever systematically studied everything the Bible says about love? Or, if you wanted to cheat, have you ever read a good book that describes all that the Bible says about love? You'd be shocked that the word that's so important to us, we have spent so little time figuring out what the Bible really says about it. All right, so I'm going to give you a, a shortcut to this study. If you will do some homework in a book that I'm going to quote a couple of things from. D.A. Carson wrote a book a number of years ago called The Difficult Doctrine of the Love of God. How's that for a title? That sounds ooey gooey. I'm using the word love, right? Find that on a Valentine's card. The Difficult Doctrine of the Love of God. Books less than 100 pages. It gets a little theologically chunky in the middle of it. First chapter is probably worth the book. If you just read that, it would be extremely helpful. I think we probably have some of these in the bookstore. But listen to this thought from the book. He says, If people believe in God at all today, the overwhelming majority hold that this God, however he, she, or it may be understood, is a loving being. This widely disseminated belief in the love of God is set with increasing frequency in some matrix other than biblical theology. We live in a culture in which many other and complementary truths about God are widely disbelieved. Right? So you come to this concept, you disarm yourself with all other ideas the Bible presents about God and who he is, and you run to him like you're going to understand his love by throwing everything else you don't care for about him into the trash can. And you're going to walk away from the Bible convinced that you understand the love of God. Well, you kind of can't do that. The result, of course, is that the love of God in our culture has been purged of anything the culture finds uncomfortable. The love of God has been sanitized, democratized, and above all, sentimentalized. This process has been going on for some time. My generation was taught to sing. What the world needs now is love, sweet love. In which we robustly instruct the Almighty that we do not need another mountain. We have enough of them. But we could do with some more love. Right, all, you hip, all you hippies remember that song? All right. All right, let me just say this about this, the way in which I want to approach this today. It is not enough for anybody in this room to, to know, like, just knowledge information on a shelf that God loves you. Just to, to be aware. To have that sort of knowledge in your hand. Yeah, yeah, God, God loves me. You're not after that. I'm not after that. That's a good starting place, but it's not what I'm after. You, you want to feel the love of God. You want to experience the love of God. You, you don't just merely want to have an awareness that there's this thing. And you've heard somewhere, you read a Bible passage, you heard a message once that God loves you. You want that to find your address. You want it to engage your life. You want it to live with you. You want it to show up in the meaningful spaces of your life. You want to feel the love of God. Now for that to be, and that's where I want us to land today, we're going to need to be aware that there are nuances to the love of God. If you want to feel it, you're going to have to be aware of the nuances, the way the Bible describes the love of God. It's sort of like tasting. Right? Tasting things. How many of you guys know there's a difference between reading the label on something and tasting it. Right, the chef over here is shaking his head big time. That's exactly true. I mean, my, my wife loves to experiment with food. It is like living with a, a culinary lab in our home <laughs> to see, wow, when you put these things together, what, what's going to be ex the experience of the mouth? It, it does me very little good when she just tells me what's in something. You know, this is in it, that's in it, this is in it, that's in it. I got to go to the store to get this and that and that. That's okay. 
But when I taste it, that's a whole different experience, isn't it? Right, so there, there's a, a, a head knowledge of ingredients, but there's tasting things that is totally different. You know, the Bible calls us to taste and see that the Lord is good. There is an experiential dimension to these things that God intends for us to experience. Now, be careful when you go to taste things. I'm not sure what your favorite sort of flavor experience is, but I'm a sweets guy. So I love sweet things. Man, I've got to finish my day with something sweet. You know, the day is not complete. I've got to have something sweet. Something inside me tells me I need that. It's a need in my life. But you know, that's not the only flavor. It might be my favorite, but it's not the only flavor experience, is it? There's, there's salty. There's savory. There's spicy. Sour is a flavor experience. Bitter can be a flavor experience. Right? You put these things in your mouth and a variety of experiences comes to us. Well, can I tell you the love of God is that way as well? The love of God does not always taste like one thing. And if you're like me and you, you have created a life where, you know, I'm, I'm just traveling down the road of sweet. So, you know, I am most in touch with God's love when it is sweet tasting. That's when I know God loves me. But if God shows up in some other flavor category, I don't notice the love of God. And therefore, I don't experience the love of God. So I have taken the universe of God's love and narrowed it down into this one particular category. And it's a valid category. And God does show up in that category. And it's even an important category. And it might be my favorite category. But it's not the only category. And if you're not careful, you're going to get a response from God that sounds like him speaking to the folks that Malachi was addressing. I have loved you. You've just stood in one place and stared at one thing and said, I don't see anything else about your love, God. I just see this. Whatever your this is, right? You got your own this. But God is showing up in other categories. Significant categories. It's interesting. You don't have this in your outline, but, but King Solomon got to a point where you know, the kingdom was being handed to him as the king. And, and God was asking him certain things and putting him in a posture to do certain things, to make, to make great requests. Hey, Solomon, ask me for anything you want, kind of a, kind of a uh, moment. And, and Solomon says this phrase twice to God in two different settings there. Solomon said to God, this is in Second Chronicles, you have shown great and steadfast love to David, my father. God, you have shown your love to my father. Solomon knew something about God showing his love. God reveals love. God makes love known. He said it again later on. He says, oh Lord, God of Israel in 1 Kings, there is no God like you in heaven above or earth beneath, keeping covenant and showing steadfast love to your servants. God shows his love. So listen, you and I are showing up looking for some love. God's looking to show his love. Now what I want to do today is I'm going to, I'm going to run us through a buffet line. And I'm going to give you a quick taste. So you know, I don't know if you go to one of those food conferences or something. And there's like these chefs that cook something. They put out like eight little plates. And you just kind of like, you just taste any of them. All right, I'm just warning you, none of these are a meal by themselves. All right, they all could be a message by themselves. And that's the danger you have right now. This is the danger of this room. I'm going to be tempted to preach eight messages. <laughs> I'm just going to try and make a spoonful. Just so you, As soon as you start going, mm, I think I taste that, I'm going to move on to the next dish. And if I don't, you guys just start doing this to me. All right? <laughs> we, we tasted that one, Keith. Get on to the next one. Because there's eight of them here. And you don't want me to bog down in any of them. All right, so here's our first taste. Because remember, we want to taste this. We want to feel it. We want to experience it. We just don't want to know about it. So I'm not going to tell you anything you don't know, but I might be mentioning things you haven't tasted well. All right, so here's our first taste. 
when God loves us as a father who disciplines, what does that love feel like in your life? When you taste that, what will it feel like? Hebrews 12, verse 3. Consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. There's your context of life. Hebrews is being told this, the writer is telling this to this audience because they're about to be faint-hearted, grow weary, and want to quit. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. And have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons? My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by him. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves. What does that taste like? When the father shows his love to his people by serving up a load of discipline in our lives. It says he chastises every son whom he receives. It's for discipline. That you have to endure. So I just got a sense of what this tastes like. It tastes like something that you're feeling like you're enduring it. How many people don't endure a trip to Disney World? That's not the kind of thing you endure. (laughs) I'm sorry, one hand went up. Bill, I'm sorry. I know that you do endure a trip. Anything having to do with Disney is an endurance issue for you. But apparently discipline, when you taste it, It it must taste bitter. How much of this do I have to eat? Is going to be the question. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? If you are left without discipline in which all have participated, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. If your life never tastes bitter and difficult and enduring... Because discipline has been brought to you by a father who loves you. You're not loved. So if right now you feel, hey, my life has just been coasting and coasting and coasting for as far back as I can ever remember. You should raise the question whether you're loved. Besides this, we have had earthly fathers who disciplined us and we respected them. Shall we not much more be subject to the father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time as it seemed best to them. But he disciplines us for our good that we may share his holiness. For the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant. That's what being loved by the Father in that moment is going to feel like. It's going gonna, it's gonna to taste bitter, not sweet. And if you're one of those people that all you're interested in is the sweet, Lord, send me the sweet. When you taste bitter, you're going to be asking the question this year, does God love me? Aren't you? And God's going to try, I have loved you. Because what he showed in stepping into our life, seeing that we needed the impact of discipline in our lives for our good, was that we needed bitter in that moment. We didn't need sweet. And I am being loved by God. And number two, I'm going to skip because I don't think I can do all these. But there, let me just say this. There is this aspect of the love of God that is wrapped up in the provision of God. The Bible describes that God provides. So when you go back and look at this passage, and I hope you will, you're going to find out that that God's providing for for sparrows, and he's, he's feeding the ravens. He's providing for them. And he turns around and says, don't you know that you are of much greater value to me than them? Do you know that? Do you know that when God provides for your life, The Bible said it's the Father's good pleasure to give these things to us. And he knows that we need them. How's that going to feel? How does the love of God feel when it's just provisional? Can Can I just say it feels very routine? It feels no big deal ish. 
It feels like the sun came up this morning. Anybody felt loved by God when that happened? When you go eat lunch today, and your first bite, and the flavors that you get to experience, and the nutrition that you get to have in that moment, anybody thinking, oh, this is the love of God for me? No, right? It's just a meal. Just another day in air conditioning. It's just, just life. And you're going to have God turn around and say, I have loved you. Number three, when God loves us as a friend who makes himself known to us, what does that love feel like? It's a different flavor. This is not the father who's disciplining us. This is a friend who is relating to us. John 15, this is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. What does that feel like to be loved that way? All right, well, think in your life. You've had friends in your life. You've gone through something, some tragedy, some struggle, some bad experience, and friends have shown up at your doorstep. They have dropped everything to make themselves available to you. And you know these, these friends had a lot going on. They've got responsibilities. They've got job things. They took the day off of work, right? You, what does that feel like when a friend shows up in your life and says, hey, you know what? I'm on site here with you. I'm with you in this. I don't, even, I don't even know. This is so hard to deal with. I don't even know what I'm doing with you, but I'm here. I'm here with you. Do you feel the love of a friend in that moment? Do you, do you have any category that you and I were in the most desperate of need and the Son of God dropped everything and entered our moment of need. Listen, if there was ever, you're, you've never had a friend outside of Jesus who literally dropped everything the way he dropped everything. You understand, for the creator to become part of his creation. The Bible says he emptied himself of his godly prerogative and role and took on the form of a servant. Do, do you feel the love of a friend in your life who drops everything? And not just in that one act, if God so loved that he, he sent his son this way, how will he not with him freely give us all things? That same love from God exists today in the heart of God. And then you have this other dimension that's in this verse. You are my friends if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing, but I've called you friends. For all that I have heard from my father, I have made known to you. Right, and, and, and you look at the context of this. This is Jesus hanging out with the disciples. They're hanging out. Do, do, you, do you hang out with Jesus? I mean, I, I mean that. There is a sense that, I mean, I crawl into my prayer closet almost every night. I go for a walk. And I've got a lot on my mind. I've got a lot of issues. I've got a lot of people. I've got a long list of things that are just crowding into that moment. And there are frequent moments where I just stop and I remember. I'm, part of me is a reason why I'm here is just to be with God. Just to be with him. Just to hang out with God. Just to, to let him share with me whatever he wants to share. To commune with me. Right? When you get around your friends, do you always have an agenda? Do you always have a list that you've got to work through? And eh, bing, timer went off. Okay, friendship done. Do you ever wonder why you don't experience the friendship of God? Because we don't know how to live in it. We don't know how to receive it. It's a category. We've got, we got no way of understanding how to taste the love of a friend coming to us from God. It's unique. It's different. Listen, this is different. This is not the love of a father disciplining us. It's a different dimension of God's love. It's going to taste a little bit different. Number four, when God's love is not affirming, but reveals our lack. Go back and read that again. How's that going to feel? When God's love 
is not affirming. And I use that word carefully, affirming, because I'm going to end by talking about how much that sweet feel of being affirmed is the flavor that we're looking for, perhaps more than anything else. But what, what does the love of God feel like when it shows up and it doesn't affirm you? It doesn't applaud what you're doing. It doesn't even like what you're doing. And it makes you feel like you might even be doing the wrong thing. Does that feel like love when God shows up and creates that flavor in your life? Right, well, he's a friend, right? Proverbs 27, 6 says, Faithful are the wounds of a friend. Profuse are the kisses of of an enemy. There are moments, and you know this, you know this relation. There are moments in your own life or in the lives of those around you that the most loving thing you can do in another person's life or that they could do toward you is not tell you what you want to hear, but to tell you what you need to hear. Those are hard moments, aren't they? You're not sure how somebody's going to respond. It doesn't create this endearing atmosphere. Listen, it's much more endearing to always tell people what they want to hear. But this passage puts that in the category of an enemy does that kind of stuff. Because an enemy doesn't really love you. They love how the benefit they get from you. And they can work you to get the benefit. So they're just going to tell you what will get a pleasant response from them. That's not the real love of a friend. A real friend is going to say what needs to be said. And that, that's how Jesus loves us. There are moments... In which he's going to say something that you're not going to like the way that made you feel. And you're going to be tempted to question the love of God. And God is going to say, I have loved you. Just loved you just now. Because that's what you needed to hear me say. All right, here's an awkward construction of a sentence. Mark chapter 10. And Jesus, looking at him, loved him. If you just stop right there, you just didn't complete the story. Loved him. Jesus loved this guy. Here's the guy Jesus is interacting with on the street. And Jesus just outright loved him. And said to him, you lack one thing. Go sell all that you have and give to the poor. And you'll have treasure in heaven and come follow me. Disheartened by the saying, he went away sorrowful for he had great possessions. You know what he was doing before, right before Jesus said that to him? He was presenting his resume, right? Good teacher, what must I do? Well, I've done this and I've done this and I've done this. He, he felt good about himself. He had reasons to feel good about himself. And, you know, Jesus just didn't turn around and affirm him. You know what? You are, you are a swell guy. Can I get the disciples over here? They'd like some autographs. This guy, this guy right here. Man, I love this guy. This guy's awesome. It did say that he loved him. And then he wounded him. So you got a pretty good opinion of yourself. You're very comfortable about yourself in several categories. But you lack something. Oh, can I just tell you as a preacher, I, I know, I won't say a third of the room feels this way because I don't really know what the correct number is, but a third's close. That if I preach something that makes you feel like you come up short before God, you don't know what to do with that. It fritzes you out. It makes you feel unloved by God. Do, do you know that about yourself? Do you know that you pick the Bible up and you force it to only say certain things to you? Rather than letting it speak the way it wants to speak to you. You may have favorite flavors, but that ain't one of them, is it? When the love of God comes to you and it makes you aware, you just ain't all that. Sorry. You come up short. Oh, you, know, you know what's operating in you? And I hope I can get to this. I hope so. Um, what's operating in that moment is you are totally convinced that you are the one generating the love of God for you. I hope I can unpack that as we move along. But that's why you can't stand to hear anybody tell you you come up short. Because if I come up short, there's no way God could love me. 
that's operating in you. And I know you get grace, and I know you understand where justification comes from. You can explain Romans 3. I I get that. But the moment you walk in here, and you hear a message that makes you go, oh, I don't do that. That's one of the things I hate about coming to this church. You know, you leave feeling worse than when you came in. Uh, boy, if, if, if the love of God can be that easily dislodged in your life, you need to go do some homework on it. I'm not apologizing for making you feel bad. Because Jesus ran around and did that. And then no moment did that mean he didn't love you. And if you've made it feel that way, that's not the preacher's fault. That's not Jesus' fault. That's your fault. You might really need to study the love of God a whole lot better than you have. So it can't be so easily stolen from you in your experience. Number five, when God loves us with longing affection. What what does that feel like? Zephaniah chapter three. Just read these quickly. The king of Israel, the Lord, is in your midst. You shall never again fear evil. Love should do that for us. On that day, it shall be said to Jerusalem, Fear not, O Zion. Let not your hands grow weak. The Lord your God is in your midst, a mighty one who will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you by his love. He will exult over you with loud singing. Do you ever get the sense that God is excited towards you? That God is rejoicing towards you? That God delights towards you? The Bible actually teaches that. Different word for love here is used. This Hebrew word means to have affection for. It's the the love of of friends. It's the love between a, a person and another person. Between a man and a woman. Between the friends that Jonathan and David were. You remember the friendship that they had. That unique friendship. It says that they loved each other. They used that word. They had this affectionate friendship. God uses that word right here. Toward us. Rejoicing over us. With a heart toward us. That feels a certain way. And that tastes a certain way. Hosea reveals this, this longing affection of God in chapter 11. He says, when Israel was, a, I mean, catch, catch God looking human here. When Israel was a child, I loved him. That's that same word. And out of Egypt, I called my son. The more they were called, the more they went away. They kept sacrificing to the Baals and burning offerings to idols. Yet it was I who taught Ephraim to walk. I took him by the arms, but they did not know that I healed them. I led them with cords of kindness and with bands of love. And I became to them as one who eases the yoke on their jaws and I bent down to them and fed them. My people are bent on turning away from me. And and though they call out to the Most High, he shall not raise them up. How can I give you up, O Ephraim? How can I hand you over, O Israel? How can I make you like Adma? How can I treat you like Zeboim? My heart recoils within me. My compassion grows warm and tender. Does God, do you taste the love of God that way toward you? This affectionate longing, desire in the God of the universe toward you intimately that uses words like tender, longing. Do do you know what that feels like? To be loved by God that way? Listen, I I know, I know if if, if you could just be totally honest in your worst moments, in your hardest moments, Or maybe for some, just in the everyday, you would say, no, I don't. I don't feel God's love that way, hardly ever. I feel like God is exacting. I feel like he's demanding. I feel like I always fall short. I feel like I never measure up. And so you'd say it with puckered lips, P.O.'d. That's the way this God has made you feel. Listen, if you feel that way, 
On a human level, I, 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 get, I get the emotion of that. I get the feeling of that. But from a biblical level, from the God who shows himself to us, you need to take responsibility for that. Because what it sounds like is you're finding the character of God to be at fault. The reason why you don't feel that way is because that's not how God is to me. Hmm, really? Because the Bible says he shows himself to us. He comes in all these flavors. And just because you haven't eaten out of that bowl and tasted that, that's not because he hadn't set that in front of you and made it available to you. So if you're sitting here pucker-mouthed, all angry at God because you never measure up, you never do enough, I never feel like I've read the Bible enough or done enough things or invited enough people to Alpha Frank, I just never have done enough. <laughs> And that's how you feel like God tastes. Uh, well, you, just, you might need to move on to the next dish and taste the God who has affectionate longings for you and not ignore that over and over and over again. I, I put in there a quick thought from the prodigal son. I remember, you, you guys know the story, so I'm not going to read the passage But against the backdrop of all that that son did, rejected his father, took what he had coming to him, left for a foreign land, lived recklessly, wasted all that the father had earned all these years and gave to his son is now wasted and gone, nothing to show for it, embarrassed the family name. This guy is, you know, he's living somewhere. Uh, he's got a father who looks like he's got some, some wealth about him. And this guy is dragging his name through the mud. And he returns back home. And what's the heart of that father like in that moment, right? You, you read it. Verse 20, Luke 15. He rose and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. That son who had a big speech prepared because he knew everything I've done doesn't deserve to be treated like anybody but your enemy. But there was something in this father's heart for his son. I, lo I love that little phrase. You've heard it explained, I'm sure, many times. While the son was still far off, how did this man notice that day? Accidentally? Or was it that father was looking and looking and longing and looking and longing for his son? So that when his walk appeared on the horizon, he knew those steps. And he dropped everything. And he ran. Did this guy come as an enemy? Did he come to take more? He come to hit me up for a few more bucks because he's down and out now? What's this sucker want now from me? The longing loving of a father runs to him. Doesn't even let him speak. Just embraces him and loves on him. Do, do you know anything of the love of the father that tastes like that? Like God actually longs for us. And embraces us. And kisses us. Listen, don't assume everybody gets that. There was another boy living in the house with that father who didn't. He didn't know anything about that kind of love. What a tragedy. Neither one of them were experiencing this love. Okay, number six, when God's love is experienced through our obedience, our actions, what does that feel like? Let me just say this. We've got some skin in the game here. Jude 1. But you, beloved, building yourselves up in the most holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God. Who's that speaking to? God? Or you and me? Keep yourselves in the love of God. You do that. 
And this is where some of the lack of experience on our part is our responsibility. It's things that we're doing that are keeping us from experiencing the love of God. Keep yourselves in the love of God. Jesus even spoke about that. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. Just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. Jesus kept himself in the love of God. He lived a life that was located in space where the love of God could be experienced. That is not what the guys in Malachi were doing. They were not living in this space. So when God shows up and says, I have loved you, they don't say, oh my gosh, yes you have. And we are overwhelmed. They go, really? Like what? Give us an example. Is that God's fault? When you don't feel the love of God, is it God's fault that I don't feel the love of God? Because we do blame God that way, don't we? If I don't feel the love of God, it's because God's not doing a good job loving me. That's the conclusion we come to. But the Bible said, keep yourself where the love of God is poured on you. Live in spaces where you get to experience the love of God. So listen, if you're here this morning and the love of God feels like it lives on the other side of the planet from you, don't just cross your arms like, what's wrong with God? Be humble enough to wonder where you've been. Skip number seven. Let me go to this last one, number eight. When God loves us with his covenant love, what does that feel like? It's a unique kind of love. It's all throughout scripture. It's an aspect, a flavor of God's love. It's not the only expression of God's love, but is a rather significant one. Here's three words, different words on love that all get used in one passage. Deuteronomy chapter 7. Verse 6, God says to his people, For you are a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for his treasured possession, a unique people, a special people to God. Now, Now notice, this presentation sounds an awful lot where God started with Malachi. How have you loved us? I chose you. That's how God defends his love. He says, I chose you. Did you, you notice your neighbors over there? The descendants of Esau? Do you see how their life goes? Do you see what I've not done for them that I have done for you? All right, so this is the same exact thing. Out of all the nations, you are a special people. Out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth. Verse 7. It was not... Because you were more in number than any other people that the Lord set his love on you, right? That word love is is to delight in, to be joined to. God does that. He sets a joining, delighting love upon our lives. For you were the fewest of all peoples. But it is because the Lord loves you. Now that's that other word, that word of affection that God has. The love between friends. It is because the Lord has this affection for you and is keeping the oath that he swore to your fathers that the Lord has brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of slavery. Verse 9 it says, Know therefore that the Lord your God is God, the faithful God who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him. He keeps steadfast love. That's a different word for love. That's the word for covenant love. You'll see it translated loving kindness. It's this word that's bound up in mercy. The loving kindness, the kindness of God, that dimension of God's love that is for us, not because we've given him reasons to be for us, but because something that is in God searches us out with an affection to be for us. And he sets that love on us. This this is perhaps the most talked about love in scripture. I'm not going to chase this rabbit, but you know, when you get to the New Testament, you pick up the word agape love, it's got a dimension of that. That's a very over, overused, most preachers overuse that, that element because the word agape is used in a lot of ways. 
But that unconditional, undeserved love, that's an appropriate understanding. There is a dimension of God's love that is exact. That's what it tastes like. It tastes like there's no reason in you or me. The reason is inside of God to love us, right? And this is, I'm going to just blitz through these scriptures here. But you go back and look at them. Romans 10, Romans 9, verse 10. This is the explanation that God gives for his love to Malachi. He says, not only so, but also when Rebecca had conceived children by one man, our father Isaac, remember she had twins, Esau and Jacob. Through the, though they were not yet born and had done nothing either good or bad. In order that God's purpose of election might continue, not because of works, but because of him who calls. God had reasons in himself to look at Esau and Jacob and say, favored, affectionately loved. And he set his love on Jacob before he had earned any of it. That's what the Bible just said, right? And it says it over and over again after that. Romans 5, 8, but God shows his love. He shows his love. And that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. How does that taste? To be loved by God when you and I don't deserve to be loved by God. Ephesians 2, verse 4, but God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us. Even when we were dead in our trespasses, he made us alive together in Christ. When we were dead, <clears throat> sinners that were dead, that were enemies of God, there was nothing in us that God could look at and could just all of a sudden say, hoo hoo, look at him. Hard not to fall in love with him. God comes in love toward us. Now that's eight categories, if you will. So I started this off by saying, fill in the blank, I feel loved by God when blank. What would you have said? <clears throat> what would be the ways without seeing this list of eight, and by the way, this is just what came to mind, I'm sure if I made a real list, it, it'd be a lot, lot longer. What comes to mind for you that makes you in touch with God loving you? What categories have you set apart? Have you made them sacred and they're, they're to your liking? When does God do something that shows up and registers with you that you say, oh, here, God does love me? Do you see a problem in that question, by the way? Limited, finite creatures? are going to tell God which categories count? Does that sound like a good deal to anybody? See, because God shows up and says, I have loved you. And there are ways that God loves us that are valuable, that are essential, that are needed, that are meaningful, that affect us, that are water to our desert souls. That God knows I need that. In, in our culture today, a culture of preference, we live in a culture of preference. You might be tempted, this is why this word falls by the wayside, you might be tempted to construct an idea that I prefer God to love me this way. And so when he shows up that way, you feel blessed. You feel like God is for you. But when he's showing up in other flavors, you wonder where he is and you're disappointed in God. I, let me, I'm going to pick on a book carefully. Some of you guys have seen or read a book. It was popular a number of years ago. It was a marriage book by a fellow named Gary Chapman called The Five Love Languages. You don't have to show your hands, but because a lot of people like the book. And there are a couple of things to like about it. And there's some things not to like about it. Um, what, what I like about the book is it, is it creates an awareness that other people experience life differently than you do. So you're married to somebody. 
you feel loved when this and this happens, but your spouse feels loved when this and this happens. So they're kind of different from you. And that's a good thing to recognize. Because if I want to connect with my wife, I want to understand what, what finds her, what blesses her. Where the book is a problem is, suppose out of the five, you've got two categories that you really like. Does that mean the other three aren't really love? Because they just don't do anything for you. Is that how love gets defined? Do you get to define love? You get to be, you, well, that, you know, it's just my personality. It's just the way I was raised. You know, I like number four and number one. And, you know, the problem is, honey, you keep showing up in number two and number three, number five every once in a while. And those just don't mean anything to me. Or can you imagine picking that up and going to God with that? You know, God, I feel loved by you when you do this. But you know, when you show up over in these categories, eh, it still doesn't do anything for me. God shows his love to us. It's us who need an education on what love is. So, you know, husbands and wives, you do this to each other. Uh, it, it's a problem on both sides. It's a helpful thing for a spouse to learn. Hey, I, I could show up in this category more. It would bless my life. It's a problem. And I, if you've ever been to marriage counseling with me, you know I've talked to you about this. It's a problem when you fail to appreciate other valid expressions of love that are coming from your spouse. That's not your spouse's problem. That's your problem. So when you say, hey, well, you know, so, he, you know, so my husband, you don't understand. I mean, I, I can't tell you the last time he brought me a card, flowers, took me anywhere special, planned for us to get away. Can't, I, I just don't, I don't feel the love of God. Okay, you know what that guy needs to learn? He needs to learn to write cards, flowers, plan special events. But when I listen to a person overlook the fact that, you know, did you forget your husband is a faithful man? Your husband's never looked at anybody besides you. He's never had longings or affection. He has kept his affections protected for you. You no, know, he actually provides quite well for you and your family. He goes to work every day in a, in a job that he partially likes and partially doesn't like. He works hard every day and he loves you through provision. Now, maybe that provision is boring like God making the sun come up this morning. <laughs> Bored to tears, God. Do something really awesome. So you feed the ravens. Big deal. Okay, that's like treating those things that way. So husbands and wives, you, you might need to learn that your spouse is loving you in ways that are super valuable. And, and you'd notice them if they went away. But while you got them, you don't notice them. Hey, let, let your husband be unemployed. Let him be lazy. Let him say, you know what? That job's too hard. I quit it two weeks ago, babe. I just didn't tell you. <laughs> but here's some flowers. <laughs> I'm pretty sure in that moment you're going to go, I ain't feeling the love, babe, because I don't know how we're going to keep the lights on and the kids are going to be in school, etc." Listen, we, we, we live in a culture that has distorted and sentimentalized love. So we want love to come to us in a particular way. I mean, I'll tell you one of the ways I think that's very dangerous and problematic is we want to feel loved because we feel special. Because we feel like somebody has recognized something special about us. Right. The self-esteem movement was not helpful in this category. Self-esteem tried to find reasons, the movement in the 80s and the 90s, tried to find reasons within yourself for you to feel okay about yourself. So it had to find categories that you could like about you. And maybe you're not like this guy over here or that person over there, but you've got these categories and you're good at this and your life matters this way. So, all right, so maybe you're not smart like this person, but you're funny and, and you're creative and, and, and you're a faithful person. All right, so it's like build your resume. See, so now I've got reasons to, to love me. And of course, in self-esteem, you're taught to love yourself first. So now I've got reasons for that. Listen, that becomes extremely problematic. Extremely problematic. When I've got to generate the reasons to be loved, I'm never going to get off that horse. I'm going to ride that thing for the rest of my life. And you're going to ride it with God as well. As you wait for... 
God to feel a certain way about you because of you. Because you've finally done something that built a resume. And look at, the, look at what I've done. There's something about us that likes that though. It almost cheapens that whole covenant love thing I just told you about. I, I don't know if I'm interested in God just choosing to love me. Just chooses to love me. What's so special about that? I want him to choose to love me because I've done something and he sees something and he's amazed by something in me. You, you could be waiting a long time for that. <laughs> it's, it's really hard to impress a perfect God. It's just, just kind of rough. Doesn't mean God doesn't take notice. Doesn't God take delight in things that we do? Doesn't mean that at all. You remember that prodigal son comes showing up back at his dad's doorstep with an empty resume. He's got nothing. He's got nothing on his resume. He can't say, I'm going home because I know my dad will love me because I've done this and I've done this and I've done this and I've done that. He comes with nothing. He's got no resume at this moment. But he is made to feel special, isn't he? The father throws a party. The father treats him like he's never done anything wrong. The father treasures him and sheds tears and cries over this. You obviously are special to me, but it ain't because of what you've done. And interestingly enough, his older brother is the opposite of that. His older brother comes with a resume. All these years, I've been faithful. I've been respectful. I've never wasted your stuff. I've done everything I was supposed to do. But he ain't feeling the love, is he? You never did that for me. Can I just tell you, if you get on this treadmill, you will never get off. If your ambition is to generate love toward yourself, you will never ride the bike fast enough and you can't do it good enough. And you are in for a miserable existence with God. Let me finish with this thought. Think for a moment. You guys go look up those quotes. They're very good quotes. I'm going to skip them though. I only feel loved by God when what? When I feel affirmed and there's no sense of any inadequacy in me, in that moment I, f- I feel loved by God. When I'm not being corrected by God, that's when I feel loved by God. When life is going my way and I'm getting the things that I want, I feel, yeah, I know God loves me then. When my personal dreams are being fulfilled like the other people I see around me, in that. Yeah, I feel the love of God in that moment. Do you understand? We've just, we've just tasted eight dishes. The love of God does not always taste the same, does it? But I have loved you, God says. And there's something about our sort of amateur approach. I think I said, do not be amateurs at exploring the love of God. We, we have an amateur approach and we're taught by our culture way too much in this category that we are missing out on the love of God all over the place and wondering if God loves us. Paul concluded his letter to the Thessalonians, the second letter, and he said, may the Lord direct your hearts to the love of God. That's what I want us to do. God, would you help us? Would you direct our hearts to your love to value it, treasure it, receive it, pursue it? I'm going to pray for us in just a moment. I'm going to read this last psalm to you because it, it, is, it is a contrast that's incredibly valuable. The band, you guys can come back up here. Psalm 103, starting in verse 8. It says, the Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in love. Abounding in, has said, steadfast love. He will not always chide, nor will he keep his anger forever. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love. His steadfast love. 
love toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. As a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. Now listen very carefully to this next little section. For he knows our frame. He remembers that we are dust. You guys are old enough to be in touch with dust. Your life is going to turn to dust. It's, it's a sobering thought. As for man, his days are like grass. He flourishes like a flower of the field. For the wind passes over it and it's gone. And its place knows it no more. But, but the steadfast love of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting for those that fear him. Can you, can you get, this is such a sobering passage. A very meaningful passage for me, right? And we happen to have some lovely flourishing flowers in the field in our little thing here. So here's, here's the life story of a lovely flourishing flower. Let's pick this one because he seems to be flourishing a little more, a little taller, red, right? Good color. This thing's going to sprout up. It's going to live in that field a month, maybe a little longer. It's going to run its cycle. It's going to die turn to dust the wind is going to blow across that field won't even know it was there its existence will have come and gone right you know why this verse jumps out at me I thought about this verse after my dad died a man who lived 96 years super meaningfully important to me and I thought, that's it, huh? He's just gone. And the rest of us just go on. Like the wind that just blows across that field. And eventually, no one will even know he was there. Maybe my grandchildren might remember something about him. But after that, he would have been a flower in a field that nobody even knew existed. How much of our lives are obsessed, obsessed with flourishing in that little month that we have an existence of? Got a little month. The wind that was blowing before you came along didn't know who you were. And the wind that's going to blow afterwards doesn't know who you are either. But you and I struggled and strained and sought to flourish and build our lives and have certain things and have certain people and have a career and raise our kids a certain way and give certain things to them. And oh, we were so obsessed with those things, spending all of our time and energy on that. I just want to work on my flourishing project. I just want my life to be everything that it can be. I'm so obsessed with this stuff. And then strangely, the psalmist says, but unlike that, the steadfast love of the Lord it's from everlasting to everlasting. Listen, if you, do you want to be obsessed with something? Be obsessed with knowing and experiencing the love of God because it never changes. It never dies. It never diminishes. It will never turn to dust. The clock doesn't run out. It doesn't expire. It's the one thing in our lives that is never going to be taken from us and it's never going to change. Even if you're a prodigal, God will come running after you when he sets his love on you. Listen, I know you're here, probably many of us have never studied the topic of love very well because we're too busy trying to flourish like a little red flower in a field. I'm obsessed with just flourishing. I've got education, I've got career, I've got bills to pay, I've got to be in the right place at the right time with the right person, I've got to know the right thing. I need to know the love of God that surpasses knowledge. That's what I need. Let's stand up together. Thank you.
Lord, I think we would all confess and agree that there's nothing in our lives that we feel like we need more than to be loved. To experience what love brings to us, what it communicates to us, what it makes our lives to turn into. Lord, there is perhaps nothing more fearful than living a life where we were not loved. But Lord, our hearts more than anything don't just cry out for love of people. They cry out for love from you. To know the love of our heavenly Father that sin has disrupted and distracted us from. We are a room full of people here this morning. We're desperate to taste that love, to feel that love. And Lord, we have just read, you are eager to show us that love. That's what I pray right now, Lord. Right now, Lord, you would break through some barriers. You would communicate these living words Lord, not like words on a label, but Lord, like an experience on our taste buds. That we would know something in an experiential way of that love. Listen, if you're here this morning, and the love of God is at a distance, you are not feeling the love of God. That may be for a couple of reasons. Perhaps you are a prodigal. Perhaps you are here and you have lived your life away from God. You have chosen another field, another land to live in. God has not been a part of the scene of your life. You have an awareness that he's somewhere out there, but the life you've run hard for and after, it's all about you. It's all about your pleasures and what you can get. What adventure can you be on next? Can I just tell you this morning, if you want to experience the love of God, you're going to need to come home. You can stand here and know that there's a father who loves you, but if you don't walk over that hill and receive that love, you will only know it by reading it from a label. If you want to taste and feel the love of God, you're going to have to leave the land that you're in and return to him. And that might be describing some here who been hanging around church or maybe this is your first time ever being here or ever being in a church and God is getting your attention and he's saying I want you to come home to me I want you to return to me maybe you've never done that maybe you've never come to God and you said God my whole life is yours I'm, I'm entrusting it to you Not my own life, my own way, but God, this is all yours now. I I give this to you. Listen, maybe you're like the prodigal. You got no resume. You're not going to be able to come to God with a long list of awesome things you've done. You might just come with a list of awful things you've done. But would, would you come? You take God at his word. Just come and let God run down the long driveway to you and throw his arms around you. He's been waiting and longing for you to come. you're somebody who you have known God at some point in your life he just wandered and drifted away you've chosen a different land to live in you just haven't walked with God you don't relate to God you can't connect with half of what was said today you don't know a friendship with God God longs for you he longs to throw his arms around you celebrate you being his son or daughter. The 
But there's something to be said about keeping yourself in the love of God. You want that? You're going to have to come get it. And I think God wants it to be that way. So if, if you feel like in some way I'm, I'm a prodigal, I want you to get up from where you are. I don't care if everybody's eyes are opened or not. And walk away from the land you've been living in. And come, come find your way forward. I want you to come come here. I want you to come receive the love of God. You have to relocate. You cannot stay where you are. The love of God will be a stranger to you. But if you'll come knowing you're abandoning the land that you're leaving to welcome whatever your father has, whatever he has for you, you're going to welcome that. If that's you, Come right now. Come. Don't, don't wait. Don't wait any longer. How long you want to live apart from him? How long you want the love of God to be a stranger to you? I don't think anybody wants that for another day. some of you guys here who prodigal's a big label maybe you don't see yourself as a prodigal but you came in here this morning and your experiencing of the love of God is weak it's not all that meaningful to you There's something to be said by God. If we are to abide in his love, we are to keep ourselves in the love of God. It's like the love of God is in a certain location. And here we are in another location. And from this place, we don't have much to say about experiencing the love of God. God wants you in this place. He wants you to abide in his love. He wants you to receive his love. He wants you to taste his love. He wants the goodness of his love to be everything you need it to be. So listen, if you're here this morning, I want to make a significant call for you. If you're not abiding in the love, you have an experience of that love of God. It's distant from you. What is it about your life that needs to change? can experience the love of God let's just do this together let's just bring our hearts before God for a moment and you be honest with him tell him are you feeling his love are you dwelling in and experiencing his love if you're not then you need to be honest with God this is too important do not travel through 2019 with this word not meaning anything to you. 
Stand this morning and say, God, I, 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 I don't feel your love in my life. And then listen. Is God responding by saying, I have loved you. And you might need to humbly ask, Lord, how? How have you loved me that I, I've overlooked? I have missed. I've misunderstood. I've misplaced. I've ignored. God, help me this morning. I don't want to go another day of not knowing and experiencing your love for me. God, fix something. Show me something. Adjust something in my life that your love would be more accessible and more real. Lord, may you open up to us your word. May we see in categories that we just wouldn't go. You are loving us in ways that matter, in ways that you have showed to us, in ways that are valuable. Lord, teach us to look for your love in categories, maybe outside of my favorites. Lord, help me to find other places where the love of God is manifest toward me. God, may I see it and cherish it and receive from it. Lord, may that be true of us, Lord. It will change our lives. We need your great love. God, we exchange every other form of flourishing for that love, Lord. We want your love more than anything else. It's to be valued more than anything else in our lives. Lord, help us to learn to receive your great love.